Good morning, everyone. We stand for the same goodness of God. singing His Name is Wonderful, page 149 of the New.
to build his life upon a prayer that seemed like a lifeless one. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever bring, we live for you, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. this morning. The altars are open. Feel free to come and pray. Dear God, we thank you for this great day that you've given us. Thank you for every breath that you have breathed into us, God. Thank you for creating this world and creating us, God. I pray that you would just breathe into us and let us sit upon your throne, that you would fill our cups up, God, and that we would overflow with your almighty power. So everyone in this world and everybody that we meet, everybody we talk to, everybody we even look at, God, that they would see you in us, that you would be shining through us, that we would be your vessel, that we would do what you want to do, that you, we would say what you want us to say, God. I pray that we would just give everything over to you this morning, God, and tonight, God, to uh, bring us all back so we can feel your glory again, so we can praise and lift up your name in this sanctuary, God. This might be our church, but the body is our actual church, God. What we say to worship you matters so much that anybody can tell they can tell when we're happy. They can tell when we're down, God. I pray that they can tell that you're inside of us every single day, every each and one of us this morning, God. I pray that you would just rain down your power from heaven this morning, God, in this service. And um, touch Brother Hodge as he brings the word this morning. And I pray that you would speak through him, that we would get to fill our cups up, God, that we would pour everything out that doesn't need to be in our hearts and take everything in that needs to be in our hearts, God. I pray that you'd be with us and touch us this morning. In your name I pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to take just a moment. We're going to pray one more time, but we're going to do different. She, thank you for the wonderful prayer. 
what we're going to do is we're going to open up the altar this morning. Um, I was having a conversation with Brother Sam this morning, and I was telling him that since 1974, when I took my first position in the ministry as a youth pastor, we, um, um, the, the pastor that I was with, um, I, I, let me back up. Actually, that's not true. I go back, man, I'm getting old. My, my first position in the ministry, I was 19. So it'd be, someone else to do that math. But anyway, it's been a long time ago, 72. And uh, so all the pastors that I've been with as a, as a youth pastor, and, and they always had open altars, pastoral prayer time, open altars. It, and it trained me, it taught me, and it showed me something. So we're going to do the same thing this morning. And I'm convinced this morning that there's somebody here this morning that just wants to come and kneel and pray about something this morning. You've got a concern. Maybe you've got a praise this morning. That's Those are good. Aren't praises good? Aren't praises good? That's much better. Much better. And you've got to praise this morning. You just want to come and praise him this morning. But you've got to, you've got to concern this morning. Whatever it might be, we want, to, we want to open up the altar. I'm going to have Debbie, she's on him playing now, to play just one time, just play that chorus through or play a chorus through. And you just come as you feel led. We're going to open up the altar this morning for prayer. You just come this time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we recognize that there are people at this altar this morning and sitting at these front pews. They've brought to you petitions and praise. And whatever their concern is, whatever their praise is, we lift them up to you as well. We share those with you, Lord. And we share it with them. We don't, not, we don't have to know what they are. Because you do. And that's all that matters. And Heavenly Father, this morning, we are, we are excited about the fact that you are still on the throne. You're still in charge. You're still in control. And everything we do, and, and you, are, you know all about it. And I pray, Father, today that your Holy Spirit would just come in a mighty way. Would you anoint Pastor Sam as he comes to speak to us this morning and use him in a mighty way this morning? Help him, Lord, to share what you've laid upon his heart that we might hear from him and hear from you. And, Lord, most importantly, take whatever we hear and apply it to our hearts and lives and respond in, in, in a way we need to respond. We do. Heavenly Father, I lift up my brother, our pastor, Lord, I know what it's like to want to preach and not be able to. I know what it's like to want a pastor and not be able to. And the pain and, this, and the difficulty is real. And I pray right now that you would touch his life and help him, Lord, and be with his family. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you've given me to know this man and his ministry. What he means to this church. I pray that you would help each one of us to 
continue to pray for him and support him in every way possible. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you in everything we do and help us, Lord, that we would respond to you in a way that would be obedient today. And we thank you for what you're going to do. We give you honor and glory and praise in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior, and he is our soon-coming King. We can't praise you enough. Thank you, Lord, for being with us this morning. We talked about the presence of Jesus, and the presence of God. We thank you for that presence this morning already. And I ask that you would continue to dwell, to dwell with us today in a mighty way. In his precious name, amen. Amen. God bless you. There's only one special way I can show you I care. I could offer opinions that might prove untrue for the only sure answer. Here's what I'll do. I will talk to my father for you. And I know my father hears what he'll do. He will let It's no bother for my father, he'll do it for you. I've never prayed fire down from the sky, but God saw each teardrop ever fell from these eyes. So if you've got a mountain and a road it's too wide, I'll take your burdens and I'll make them mine. I will talk to my father for you I know my father and here's what he'll do he will lay at your feet all the things you pursue it's no bother for my father, he'll do it for you. Let me talk to my father for you. I know my father, and here's what he will do. no bother for my father he'll do it for you oh it's no bother for my father he'll do it for you
It's good to see you all out today. I'm glad you're here. I know there's a lot of sickness still going around, but it's good to see you all. It really is. Um, today, our scripture is going to be found in Matthew chapter 11. If you would stand with, with us, please, for the reading of God's word. I'd like to draw your attention to the last three verses. Beginning with verse number 28, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, says, come to me, I'm a little emotional today, <laughs> says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to be here in your house. I know, Lord, there's a lot going on. There's many of us who don't feel well. We know our brother, Pastor Dwayne, does not feel well. Touch his body. Right now, Lord, I pray that your presence be so real in this room. We invite you to this place. We want you here. And we want to be at your feet. Use me today for your glory and nothing else. Amen. All right. So talking about what we're going to talk about today, I, I take it very seriously, and I, I don't say things to bring back bad thoughts, bad memories to people, but sometimes we just need to face them, don't we? How many in here today are burdened? You know, in life, it doesn't matter whether you're young, whether you're middle-aged, whether you are elderly, we all have carried a burden, or we are carrying a burden. You know, we all struggle, or we have struggled to the point of failure, to the point of dissatisfaction, to the point of not really having concern. We've all struggled with a burden that won't leave our minds, keeping us up at night, not getting good rest. Anxiety takes over. Anxiety is real. Fear has overwhelmed the soul. Worry is now the new hobby. The thoughts that run through our mind are taken to a higher level that have never should have been reached. But we found ourselves in a state of depression, in a state of guilt. We found ourselves overwhelmed. We found ourselves stretched way too thin. We found ourselves in a state of disbelief or confusion or a state of helplessness. Say with me today, I'm tired of mind games. Say it, I'm tired of mind games. You know, I've noticed that there is uh, several different types of burdens. And if you've lived life at all and experienced it, you could probably agree. You know, like I just described, you know, there's burdens as far as the guilt, depression, overwhelm, we're stretched too thin. There's feelings that affect our feelings. It affects our minds. It affects our emotions. It even comes to a point to where enough is enough, and it affects the physical body. But there's also a burden that affects the soul deep down. 
I'm talking way, way deep down, and it's, it's kind of hard to explain. Some of us don't realize it just yet. Some of us do. But there's a burden inside the soul deep down that we're longing for something more. Longing for something more than, than anything. You know, the emptiness that we have, that emptiness deep down inside the soul, if it's not filled with Jesus Christ, mm, we begin to search. And we begin to look for other things to fill it with. For other people to fill it with. Those things are just temporary. Those things will constantly lead us back to searching for something to fill the emptiness deep down inside the soul. And of course, then it leads to the emotional and the physical distress that our body goes through. How many know someone who is never satisfied? Yeah, I see that hand. <laughs> you know, we know, I do too, buddy. You know, we know people who are not satisfied with their homes. They're constantly buying and selling. It's bigger, it's better. Too many steps, not enough steps. I want a basement, not enough room. Kids moved out to, you know, it all happened. People just get dissatisfied with things. I know people that their car is their pride and joy. But they never seem to find that one car. It's constantly switching. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with having a nice home or having a nice car. I'm not at all. You know, there's people who cannot be satisfied in relationships, whether it be sexual or, or not. They're constantly switching it up. You're not content with your friends. It's always their fault. And it's never our fault. The emptiness that we've looked for, that we've searched for, it's led us to friends and people who have drug us down the wrong road to fill more emptiness drug and alcohol addiction that's one way it starts so I'm going to go fruit loop on you just for a minute I want you all to close your eyes and if you don't want to close your eyes at least just bow your head but just close your eyes and I want you to think okay I want you to just to go into your mind and you're standing in a room okay and you feel heavy I want you to think of the burdens that are on your shoulders. It could be the burdens that I described. It could be the burdens of, uh, of someone else. But whatever your burden is, there are boxes in front of you. Those boxes represent individual burden, burdens. Some of you may have a whole room full of burden boxes. And some of you may just have one or two. But ever how many you have, there's this great big huge box. And I want you to take those individual boxes and place them inside the big box. Got to move quick, guys. Place those individual boxes inside that one big box. Now pick it up. Oh, it's heavy. It's getting really heavy. With every step, your legs get a little weaker. With every step, your arms and your backs begin to hurt. Your fingers are starting to get numb, and you're looking for somewhere to place it, but there's nowhere to place it. You can't set it back down because it's going to hurt too bad. Then all of a sudden, a bright light shows within the room. I mean, it is so bright. It almost blinds you, and you look at the light, but you can't see it because the box is too big. 
The box is way too big. You can't see over it. You can't see around it. You're standing backwards and you're looking over your shoulder and you notice that the white light is so pure and that there's a silhouette of a man with his arms stretched out. You even notice the fine detail of the light shining through the holes in his hands. And he says, come to me. Without doubt, without fear, you walk to him and you give him the box. Open your eyes. If you would draw your attention to verse number 28, the man in the white light, the bright light, with the light shining through his hands was Jesus and he gave you an invitation of come to me. Jesus is inviting you here in this passage. He is inviting you into his presence. And he is wanting you to accept the invitation of life with him. Come to me. It's different than what we read in chapter 4. You know, chapter 4, somewhere there towards the end, Jesus is gathering the, 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 the beginnings of his first disciples. And he says two words to, I believe it's Peter and Andrew. He says, follow me. There's a different understanding of who Jesus was then. We know right now for sure that Jesus is the Messiah. We know what his purpose is. We know that he came, he died, he rose. He did it all for us. He told those boys, follow me. But he says to us, come to me. Come to me. Hmm. We must first come to Jesus before we can follow him. If you here today continue to turn down, take a rain check, not accept the invitation from Jesus of come to me. Maybe you think that there will always be tomorrow or maybe that you'll always have time to get things right with the Lord. Then the next thing that you might just hear him say is depart from me. And then you will go into a place of eternal punishment. If we go on down in the verse, it says all who labor. It's not just for two or three. It says all. We didn't come in here today, or you all didn't come in here today, and we didn't hand you all numbers. We didn't say we're going to wait, and when we do an altar call, if we call your number, you're more than welcome to come up and receive whatever it is Jesus has to offer you. No, we didn't do that. We didn't say, okay, today, uh, this section over here, there's going to be probably three or four that we're going to let come on up. And then uh, maybe next Sunday we'll get to you guys. This section here, I'm gonna, we're going to say that there's about four that can come out of this section. And this section over here, there's just no room for you all this month. So keep coming and we'll try and get to you next month, okay? No, that's not how that's go. It's for all. The invitation of come to me is for all. All. All of those who are weary. All of those who are carrying the big boxes. All of those who, um, who are weary from his own attempt of spiritual rest. His own attempt of spiritual rest. That, people try that. Man's own failed efforts. All who are looking for a place to hand over the big boxes, come to me. If only a few find rest from sin and unnecessary burdens, then it's because only a few come to Christ to receive it. Verse 29, it says, Then after we have come to him and received the rest, that we've been longing for. We are then to what? Take his yoke. And learn from him. 
What is a yoke? Let's play that first slide. I don't want my younger generation not to know what a yoke is. That is a yoke. So a yoke, it's a wooden frame, and it's, it's used to connect two animals together, okay? Or they say yoke them together. That's what they're talking about. It goes around their necks, uh, and it's used so two animals can work together, okay? So many times, uh, let's say oxen, they would be yoked together. They'd be connected together so they could uh, plow a field or so they can move a heavy load, all right? Go ahead to the next one. That's how they use, that's how they use a yoke, okay? So what is the yoke of Jesus Christ? Why does he want us to put on a piece of equipment that is used for difficult labor? Is, it, is coming to him and receiving his rest, is it a trick? Is it a trick to get us to get involved into uh, a, a much more extensive labor? More burdens? Greater hardships? No. His yoke is one of learning. It's one of learning of living a life that is worthy of living for Christ, for God. You see, a yoke, it can also be used as a training tool to teach. So the best way I know how to explain it is if uh, I'm not a farmer, but if a farmer, let's say, had another ox, a young ox, that didn't know what to do, didn't know how to perform, didn't know his duty, he would yoke the young ox with an older one that was mature, that knew his role, that knew what he was supposed to do. And as they went along and worked, many times, what I've seen in videos, if the young ox gets the bucking and carrying on, the old one will just stop. The young one will get tired of it, and then they'll move on. The process keeps going. But through that process, through being tied with the old, mat older, mature oxen, the young one learns. He teaches the young one that he has a purpose. He teaches the young one that, hey, this work ain't too bad when it's shared. You know, taking the yoke of Jesus, it sounds difficult. It sounds like hard work. It sounds like plowing a field or pulling a load is hard work. But I haven't read anything where it says Jesus promised soft grounds for plowing. And I haven't read anything where Jesus promised a level path for pulling a load. But sharing a yoke with Jesus, it does guarantee us a close and a personal relationship with him. Which will make our burdens light. A yoke shared with Jesus will free us from self-centeredness. A yoke shared with Jesus will free us from uh, the load of self-righteousness. You know, the load that is shared with Jesus, it frees us to live in a way that God intended us to live. Christ himself is the teacher who can teach us in matters of bringing rest to the soul. Also, a rest that removes guilt from sin. Picking up and putting on the yoke of Jesus, it shows submission. It shows submission to him. It shows submission to the teacher. It says, I'm with you. I've accepted the invitation to come to you, Jesus. And now I want to learn and be trained by the master. Have you ever tried to learn a new task and was taught by a bad teacher? You know how much more difficult that is to learn that new task? You know, I have bosses running through my head right now or, or old employees. I work with good employees now, so we're all good. But have you, ever, have you ever been trained or learned from someone that was not a good teacher? You know, when you can't get it right or you can't process what they're wanting you to do, then they get rude and hateful, pop off smart remarks, 
You know, I've even had a time or two where I was yelled at and possibly cursed at with profanity. I learned a lot then. <laughs> I mean, I was just, yeah, I'm prepared for this world. <laughs> they even made fun of you. They even might have even got physical, and that whatever it was you was working on, they just yanked it out of your hand and said, just give me that. I'll do it myself. Yeah, that's everything Jesus is not. It says here in Scripture that he is gentle and lowly. He's humble. If you listen and follow his leading, he will correct you gently. He will humbly guide you. His yoke is easy. It won't rub your neck raw. It won't pull too hard on the shoulders because the load spread evenly between you and him, and most of it's on him. And the best part, he's with you every step of the way. Say, Jesus is with us. Uh, I don't believe it. Say it again. Good. You know, the obligations of the gospel, they're blessed ones. And strength is supplied when yoked with Jesus. Following his direction, accepting the invitation, come to me are all steps of being freed from burden. And while you are learning, he still provides the rest our souls long for. Can you visualize in your mind how awesome it would be to be connected so closely to the master? Can you see that? Why not make it a reality? If you can. You know, when we're not yoked with Jesus, when we're not in, in, in partnership with him, life is a lot harder. I've lived the other life. You know, we typically make it harder on ourselves because we allow the devil to control our thoughts. We allow the devil to get into our minds and take over where Jesus should be. We allow him to get in the conversations in our heads. And man, they're so good. Not. <laughs> but he's so good at it that it sounds so good that we begin to believe him. Have you been there? Say, I'm tired of the mind games. <laughs> Not being yoked with Jesus leads us to carrying our own baggage. Let's see the photo of the uh, statue. Can you see it? Yeah. So you may look at it and say, well, he's got the big head. <laughs> and he does. But you know what I see? I see a man that's not yoked with Jesus. I see a man that has allowed too much to affect him. I see a man that's not kept his eyes on the prize, so to speak. Or a woman. However you choose. I see a person that is not in tune with the Lord. They've allowed too much to get in the way. And even though we may not look like that, I say a lot of us in here can relate to trying to wag around the weight of the sh world on your shoulders. That has a whole lot of meaning because a lot of times just the weight of the world is in your head, which is on your shoulder. If it gets in your head, it won't be too long before it reaches the heart. That's a photo that my wife uh, printed for me because I have a tendency to sometimes let my head get ahead of my heart. I get into my own mind. You know, no one can see what we're carrying around. Everything on the outside may look fine, but on the inside, we feel like the statue looks. Nobody to help. On my cart, the wheel fell off a few times. I'm sure it has with you all, too.
David, would you come? If you can relate to what we just seen, raise your hand. Yeah. I didn't think I was the only one. I felt that. The devil wanted me to say, you're alone. This is probably one of the loneliest seasons in life that I or anyone else has ever been in. But one time, I can remember this. Whenever I felt so alone, I was at a place where there was about mm, 60, 70 of my friends. I knew them all. And I never felt so alone. I couldn't understand it. I didn't get it. How can I be surrounded with all my friends or what I thought were friends, but yet still feel so alone? And I remember thinking to myself, this is hogwash. <laughs> and then I heard, you don't have to be alone. And it stopped me in my tracks. So I go and I sit in my car and I call at the time we were engaged, but I call Leslie and I said, I think the Lord is speaking to me. And she said, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I said, I don't know. But I said, I believe I need to go and talk to dad. So I went home at three o'clock in the morning. I turned on his light in his bedroom. I said, Dad, I need to talk to you. What is it, son? I said, I feel alone. But the Lord's been speaking to me. So I sat on the side of his bed. And we talked. And he prayed. And I gave my heart to the Lord. When I get alone and I feel so alone, I go back to that time to where I was with all those people and I heard from the Lord. I've been waiting for the, to hear from the Lord. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than normal to hear from the Lord. A lot of times that's because of us. I've always heard my whole life and I believe with all my heart that the Lord works in mysterious ways. But we miss out on a lot of the blessings. And we miss out on a lot of what the Lord is trying to say to us. You know, you may come to me and say, Pastor Sam, the problems I have that I keep to myself, they're in my mind and they're real. But you want to know what else is real? The crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may say, Pastor Sam, the pain that, that I feel, it, it's so tiring. And it wears me out. The guilt of the sin that I've been carrying, it's too much. And I don't want anyone else to find out. I feel so alone and I feel so empty. You know what else is empty? The tomb of our risen living Savior. The one that he walked out of. You know, but the conversations, Pastor Sam, in my head, the doubt, the worry, the fear, the anxiety, being overwhelmed, it's killing my spirit. And it's so powerful, it consumes my time. It's so powerful, it paralyzes me. It's so powerful, it tacks me at night and it keeps me up at wake. It keeps me up awake at night and it's in my dreams. It's so powerful. But you know what else is powerful? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that will come reside in you when you accept the invitation of come to me from Jesus. The reality of the cross is foolishness to a dying world. But I stand here today to tell you that Jesus is the way Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the life and no one comes to the Father except through who? Except through Jesus Christ. And when you come to Jesus, he will give you life 
and he will allow you to have it abundantly. All while experiencing his rest. Apart from the grace of Christ and the saving work of the cross, it would be impossible to convince people that the easy yoke of Jesus is doable, yet alone easy. But for those who accepted the invitation and lived yoked with Jesus are convinced that there is absolutely no other way to live. Do you believe that today? You know, the world would say, who in the right minds would allow, would follow a so-called higher power that you cannot see? But I'm here to tell you today, and my question would be to them, who in the right minds would go back to the gods of self? Who would go back to the gods of money? Who would go back to the gods of lust? Who would go back to the gods of power? Is not love better than hate? Is not purity better than lust? Is not reconciliation better than retaliation? Isn't rest for the soul better than selfish pride? So my question for you today is, whose burden are you carrying? Whose burden do you carry? Would you stand? If you know what I'm talking about, if you've experienced the things that I've mentioned, you're not alone. The devil wants you to be alone. He wants you to feel those things. He wants you to be full of doubt. He wants you to be full of worry. He wants you to be full of fear. But I'm here to tell you today that's hogwash. You don't have to be. Today, if you are in this room and if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, would you come? He's invited you. If you've not said yes to the Lord, would you come? If you're in this room today and you have given your life to Christ, if you're in this room today but you have found yourself maybe a little lost, would you come? Don't wait another minute. If your relationship's exactly where it needs to be with Jesus, praise God for that. But if you've just been carrying too big of a box, would you come? Today's the perfect day to lay that down at the feet of Jesus and never have to pick it up again. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for the deepest portion of your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden is light would you come